Knowledge Stream is made possible by a generous gift provided by the Appold Family Charitable Fund. Thank you very much, Doug. And uh, thank you for your persistence. Uh, for some of you, as I understand, we have a lot of repeat customers here. I was actually on the bill for last April and had to cancel at the last minute because I was moving to Penn State. Uh, so we, we actually set that up even further in advance because of a colleague who had seen me speak a year before that. So the, the history of my being here goes back to 2017, actually at a conference in Seattle. So it was a long road to get here, um, but I'm very grateful for her persistence and, 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 and bringing me out. Um, I've never been to, well actually I've been to Toledo once before on purpose. Uh, I was here sort of many times, sort of on accident in the long drive between Corning, New York and Madison, Wisconsin. And you, you have a nice Friendly's restaurant down in Maumee and we would always stop there with the kids because that was a convenient halfway point. But other than that, I've really never spent much time in Toledo, so I'm really grateful to, to see it, to, to get to know the people, get to know the programs. You can check out the, the Glass Pavilion later today and the Art Museum. So it's, this is, this, it's good that I'm here. It's good that, that, that you're a glassy place. I'm, I'm a glassy person. And um, we, we kind of bring those two things together. So what I'd like to talk to with you about today is glass and the science of glass. But I want to preface this, even though this is Science Saturday, so presumably a lot of you have some sort of a background in science, but I know a lot of people necessarily don't. Especially for, for, for people who I work with a lot, I work with artists a lot. I also work with, as, at a museum, I work with uh, small children, I work with adults who maybe don't have a science background, who are just at the museum or at uh, some sort of an event and want to learn about what I have to talk about. So even though this is a science talk, my goal and, and sort of a, a meta text for this presentation is science communication to people who are not science literate necessarily. Uh, so you'll kind of hear uh, sort of things that I'm doing. And so for those of you who are like scientists or, or professors in sciences, I hope you can take something away about uh, the way that we communicate uh, complex topics, jargon-based topics, and, and ways of, of bridging between different populations to help anybody understand who you are and what your world is about. Just so you know kind of my, uh, my entry point into this. Uh, so I'm actually originally from Los Angeles and my dad was, a, was an artist in Los Angeles, an industrial artist though. So he worked for a defense contractor uh, in, in the Los Angeles area. And his job, this is in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, his job was actually to do photorealistic renderings of naval weapon systems. So this, this is before CAD, before uh, computer-generated uh, computer images and stuff. He would make these beautiful paintings using airbrush that looked exactly like a photograph of a submarine or of a missile system or a projection system of some sort. And I, I learned from that sort of vicariously, I realized over the years, what it was to be an artist whose job was to ta communicate technical topics then I have now subsequently, 40 years later, become a scientist who communicates things to artists and to the general public about the science and the engineering. So there's a lovely symmetry here. Uh, but I, like I said, I kind of absorbed that through uh, osmosis, I suppose. Um, but also because he would bring home lots of uh, art materials for us to play with, as well as set me up with a chemistry set and a, photograph, uh, a developing lab and all sorts of things in the house. So it was really a nice a nice environment to grow up in. I did my undergraduate work in New Mexico at New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, New Mexico Tech, sometimes called Blow Up U, because they're one of the few schools in probably in the world that actually has an explosives testing facility on campus, uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, graduate work at the University of Wisconsin at Madison uh, in metallurgical engineering, materials engineering. Well, I called it metallurgical engineering, but my focus was primarily on glass and glass science and, and uh, how, how glass gets manufactured. So the, that took me to a job with Corning Incorporated where I was a research scientist for about 16 years, uh, helped invent things like the process to make the glass in your screens and your, and your iPhones and things like that. Um, and then but, but as part of that job, I started working with artists who worked for the Corning Museum of Glass, which was 
just in town there. And that's where I discovered that I really love to teach science, teach glass, teach about, about things and how things are put together to people who had a, a very deep relationship with the material but didn't necessarily know why it did the things that it did. But they were really curious about that. because why, why is it transparent? Why does it break the way that it does or not break at certain times? Why can I shape it the way that I do? And all of those, all those things, because of this 20, 30 years of, of experience in materials engineering, I had answers to those questions. Because that's what materials engineers do, is we understand how things are put together at the atomic level and then use that understanding to sort of build upward to, to reasons as to why, why when you've got a piece of glass like this, why does it behave the way that it does? So I can talk about the very big, relatively, to an atom by understanding the very small. And this gets to a really uh, ancient idea, of, going back to alchemy, of the saying, as, as above, so below, as below, so above. That you can understand the macroscopic by understanding the microscopic and vice versa. And that's really just materials engineering in fifth, uh, fifth century uh, language. So that's, that, that eventually, working at the Corning Museum of Glass, then finally led to the job at Penn State, and that's why I'm here. Um, so what I want to do today is talk about this idea of what glass is. A lot of people have ideas about what glass is. So part of this is sort of a demystification. But I'll talk probably for, I don't know, probably 30 or 40 minutes, and then open things up for questions. Because I find that people have a lot of ideas and questions and misunderstandings, misconceptions about the nature of glass that we can answer with this. But then use the, what we're going to develop as a common language, a common culture around materials through the course of the talk that we can then use to discuss what does glass do and, and answer questions, but not with the expert talking to the other people, the others, but really as colleagues, because we now have that, that common, uh, common understanding. So this gets to the idea, this idea of, of how do we communicate science? How do we talk about things? And th this idea of words. So this, I, I actually thought of this this morning. I wanted to work in. Uh, so Spunkshine is an is a electronic band that I've been getting into lately. And they have a song called Keeping One's Attention from their album, The Brotherhood of Good Explosions. So I, I, a lot of things with me kind of come back to explosions. Um, but the, 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 the song begins actually just with this, this, uh, this sampled recording of a voice. It sounds like it's from the 1950s. Of, of, at the beginning of, of, it would have been like a... Uh, like an audio test that someone was administering, and they found this and they sampled it and put it in the song. But you hear this voice going, give me your attention. In this test, you will hear a series of long and short sounds. Pause. This is a short sound. And then this thing's a meh. This is a series of short sounds. And at that point, the bass drops and the song begins. So the song is a test as a series of short sounds, or a series of short and long sounds combined together. It's this brilliant way to sort of lead you into this idea of communication that music is just a series of short sounds, or mixed short and long sounds laid over top of each other. But if you don't know that, if you don't understand what things are, we have to agree on what the sound means for it to be communication. In the case of music, the meaning comes in the way the sounds are arranged. And it's, it's somehow evocative of our primate brains to draw emotions out of us or to put it in sort of a cultural context. But ultimately, it comes back to getting things defined in some way so that you understand what I'm saying right now. So it, it gets also, in, in, when talking about scientific topics, this, something that you learn in for the first lesson that you learn in fresh, freshman chemistry is the difference between these two words, accuracy and precision. They're very, very different concepts that often in everyday talk, we, we overlay those all the time. Say, so, well, you, you misuse accuracy as a term for precision. So I'm going to put it in your head in a way that you'll never forget. So three and an eighth is a perfectly serviceable for almost anything, well, anything that, uh, that almost anyone in this room is ever going to do, that's a perfectly serviceable definition of the number pi. It doesn't have to be 3.141926387. I've read somewhere that no, no scientist in the world has ever had an actual reason to use pi beyond about 200 digits, which I don't know exactly what they were doing, but that's pretty insane. 
but and yet it, it's a challenge for scientists to calculate it out a trillion digits or more. Even though those trillions of digits mean absolutely nothing in terms of utility, practical utility, three and an eighth is perfect. Three is actually I have a friend from college who was uh, an astrophysicist, and he said, for an astrophysicist, pi equals one. It's so small compared to the numbers that we deal with that it, it, it's it's it's. You just forget about the pi part if you're like measuring the circumference of a galaxy or something. Um, so we don't need to always give all the digits. And the, the scientists like to chase digits. Chasing precision is an important thing. Understanding how things are, how things happen, why things happen, as precisely as possible is an important foundation to have in understanding how the world works. What an engineer's job, I'll, I'll tell people, people ask me, what's the difference between a scientist and an engineer? Because I will put out there that I'm both a scientist and an engineer in practice and the work that I've done over my career. A scientist figures out how much precision, what, what things are precisely. An engineer's job is to figure out how much of that precision is actually necessary to do the job. Because that precision is very expensive. If you're going to build a, machi a, a machine and require all of the parts to be precise to the number of digits, to this number of digits, you're never going to get anything made. Even, even out to, say, six digits of precision, so 3.1415926. If that mattered to you, your machine could cost billions of dollars. If it matters to you only that three and an eighth, you can make that with a drill in your, in your garage. You have to understand what's important, how much precision is actually important in order for you to get the job done. And then it becomes useful. So my job as a science communicator, back to the meta narrative here, is to figure out how much precision is actually necessary to communicate the ideas. If I'm up here and I'm giving a lecture to uh, graduate chemistry students, I'm going to use more precision in my language. We're going to have co words in common that will allow me to talk about things at a, in a very different level than I'm going to assume for this audience. And that's nothing against you. You're just not trying to become chemists which, you know, bless you, right? Um, sorry. <laughs> Dissing my host. Um, but you, you have different things in mind for what you want to do with your life. It's like talking, when I, when I talk about what glass is to artists, it's not that they have, they're, they're lesser people, they just have lesser requirements on precision in that particular aspect. So learning as a science communicator, when to dial back the precision, but you've got to keep the accuracy on. You've got to stay essentially true to what it is that you're trying, the phenomenon that you're trying to describe. But it doesn't always have to be that level of pi. Sometimes three and an eighth is just fine. So we're going to talk about a lot of words. I'm going to use a lot of words, but I'm going to take time to define those words. So like I said, we're going to build up this culture in the, in the room today. And so that by the end, I can use I can talk about something, I'll say it now, and only a few of you in the room who are former students of mine will get it, but we're going to talk about kids in the class, or kids on the playground. That doesn't mean anything to you right now other than visions of children out on a playground. By the end of the, the talk, that's going to be a very important image for you, I would posit. So let's get into, this, into the subject matter here. So what is glass? This is, this is our big question that we're going to try and answer today. A lot of people have ideas about what glass is. Is it a solid or is it a liquid? Is it an undercooled liquid? Some people have heard that or have ideas that it might be an undercooled. Is it a fourth state of matter, as fourth being gas, solid, liquid, glass? Or is it a, <laughs> I like the, is it a state of it doesn't matter, right? That ultimately it's not, not what it is. It's just, it, it, it's, it's so, even to call it anything is just too precise and it does, you don't really care. But what I would put out to you is that there is an answer, that it isn't paradoxical. It's not this sort of, is it this or is it that? What it comes down to is this idea of being a verb. Glass is a verb. Sometimes we just try to put things in the wrong boxes. We're going to come around to this, what it means to be a verb. This is where uh, Buckminster Fuller is going to come in in a second. But first, talking about this idea of, of words and, and using words wrong. So you've heard the term perhaps liquids. Uh, to define a liquid, you say it's something that takes the shape of its container. So here's a few things that are taking the shape of their container. <laughs> are glasses, are, are cats liquids? 
there was actually a paper that was published about this in the scientific literature, well, the semi-scientific literature, although it was wonderfully written uh, by a mechanical engineer a few years back. He actually won the Ig Nobel Prize for, for, for that paper. Um, talking about, I mean, in very precise scientific terms, talking about the rheology of cats and their relaxation behavior and how they how they can fill things up. Clearly, cats are not liquids. And cat, cats are sort of solids, but they have liquids inside them. There's an in-betweenness about them, right? So what it comes down to is we're, we're really using the wrong word to just. We see an idea, we see a phenomenon, we see a cat filling up a volume very, very well and sort of flowing into it. But it's not that they're not a liquid or a solid. It's just not the right words to be using to describe it. This is where we get to the idea of, of Buckminster Fuller. You know, Bucky Fuller, I call him Bucky. Bucky's a friend of mine, or would have been, I think, um, with the, the inventor of the geodesic dome. But this is a quote from, from uh, Buckminster Fuller. I don't know what I am. <clears throat> I know that I am not a category. I'm not a thing, a noun. I seem to be a verb, an evolutionary process, an integral function of universe. So something that's happening rather than something that is sort of statically definable as what it is. In terms of our, our friends here, cats are something that is happening, right? They, they adapt to the space that they're in, but they're always in this state of adaptation. They're not a static thing, they're, they're, they're living things. And this is to, to the point of, point of the talk, name of the talk, you're all verbs too. And we kind of emphasize your verbishness, that you, verbosity, I've, I, I don't know. Um, probably that's not quite the right word, um, could be. Uh, th th that's th this idea that we can step outside of a definition, we can step outside of a binary uh, and talk about how things fit into new, new directions, new axes, or new, new sets of variables. So what we're going to talk about, so th this is the part of the talk for, 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 for the, the youngsters here learning how to give talks. You tell people what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. This is the tell them what you're going to tell them slide for things. But I, I, we're going to talk about what stuff is, how, what things are made out of. Stuff is made out of atoms. It's what everything is made of. Those atoms take particular patterns when they're put together. They bond together in very specific ways. They can come together once they're bonded in various types of assemblies as well. At a higher level, we'll talk about mixtures, excuse me, compounds and solutions. We'll talk about temperature and transformation, our kids on the playground. And we'll finally kind of come back around to verbs and, and, and how glass happens rather than what glass is. So with that in mind, what's science? It's Saturday morning science. We should science a little bit, right? So some of this will be sort of review. But again, what I want to try and do is set up a common language so that everybody sort of comes up together with a, a similar uh, image set. So stuff is made out of atoms. Ad the, 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 you know, the, the middle of the atom is something we call the nucleus. It's made out of some combination of protons and neutrons. Today, we're not going to care about neutrons. Not that they're not important and they don't do important things. We're just not going to talk about them today. We can talk about them afterwards if you have questions. Protons are also there in the nucleus, and they have what we call a positive charge. It doesn't necessarily mean, it, we, we're not going to talk about what, what positive means, although one of the things I've learned, and the kids on the playground should try to tip you off to this, is there's a lot of good ways to explain things in a common way that really relate to sociology, to uh, humanity, those bridging moments. Chemistry, it's easy to talk about chemistry, introducing people using food. <laughs> we were talking about last night, home brewing for, is a great way to talk about biochemistry. Uh, but we're, we're going to uh, talk about protons. You can think of protons are just as very positive beings. They're like, yes, <laughs> um, I'm a proton. That's great. Electrons are negative. Maybe we, maybe we don't want to call them that the, the, they're sort of the, the downers of the group, but um, electrons arrange themselves around the outside of the atom in a way that balances out the, the, the inside. So there's the positive and the negative, and they, they hang out together, right? And that in, in the service of accuracy, that's good enough. We don't need, I don't need to draw shells up here. I don't need to talk about anything like that. That's, that's plenty. Wrong button. So when I've got these atoms together and they've got their electrons around the outside, 
the, the, the number of electrons that are around the outside and the way that they arrange themselves will tend to put the atoms together in very specific ways. It's sort of like a, the, the Tinker Toy analogy that if I've got a Tinker Toy hub and it's got four holes around the outside, I can't put a, there's not a fifth hole. I can't put a fifth stick in that. I can put four. I can put three or two as well. And if I bring in something else that's got three or two and to my two or three, I can sort of help to kind of bring these things together. But it's geometry. The atoms are following very specific rules. Chemistry is all about rules. Chemistry, learning to be a chemist is learning about, learning the specific sets of rules that relate to how things uh, react to each other. And the, the thing governing those rules is those electrons and the patterns that the electrons make around the outside. So you can think about the electrons as sort of the personality of the atom, that it, it sort of gives it a, a way that other atoms are going to look at that atom and say, I'd like to hang out with you. I'd like to stick around with you. I'd like to bond with you. I'd like to become one with you, or U2, or U4, or whatever it is. It's that, that, that becomes the, the motivation and the underlying rule set that defines how atoms are going to come together. It could be two-dimensional like this, or three-dimensional like the tetrahedron. But the, there's an underlying reason that goes all the way back down to the atom and its electrons and the electrons were related to the number of protons that actually puts things together for us. This, these patterns, again, are very specific. They're like wallpaper in two dimensions or like really cool sculptures in three dimensions. As you begin to say, well, it, if, I'm, if I'm sitting here and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six things around me, as we'll see when we get to a certain element or a certain compound that you all know, that makes a very specific type of pattern. This happens to be the pattern that quartz makes, where I've got my central atom here of silicon with four oxygens around it, and those oxygens want to bond to the silicon as a tetrahedron, because the silicon wants four, needs four electrons. The oxygens say, here, have one of mine. And if you've got four things around a sphere, that makes a tetrahedron when they're ev evenly spaced. It's geometry. This pattern, then, isn't just happening at the local scale. This, this tendency to form patterns is one of the strongest forces in the universe. It really pushes out from the atoms and shows us at the macro scale, or microscopic to macroscopic scale, exactly how the atoms are, put, are coming together. And to the point of this idea that atoms have this human quality, Scientists actually call this tendency for things to grow with very specific patterns the habit. So the habit of the crystal, it, it, it's, it's a habit. It's the way that it happens. It, and it all relates back down to that, that fundamental symmetry. So we have quartz here. And you can see there's sort of a six-fold symmetry, like a hexa, hexa, hexagram around the outside of it. That is related to the way that those tetrahedra arrange themselves with six-fold symmetry, six turns six turns. They grow, the, the atoms in the quartz arrange themselves so they grow faster in one direction than others. You can see that in the way the crystals get longer before they get fatter. All these things are this as above, so below. The habit of the crystal is telling you something about how the atoms are put together. And it could be, like I said, the microscopic scales or something you can hold in your hand, but it just keeps going. These are selenite crystals, gypsum, the uh, calcium sulfate crystals. This is a person. This is naturally occurring gypsum crystals in a cave. It just keeps going. You give it a chance, the atoms just keep following these rules, following these attachments, and assembling themselves over massive, massive length scales. So th these bonds can happen as, they, as, as different types of atoms have a different affinity for other atoms. They want to hang out with them more or less. Again, related to the, 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 the atoms themselves, the, the way the electrons are put together, and how they get along with the atoms next to them. So you can have these very strong bonds, usually with an atom that is the same as the one next to it. Or, or the, the, so you have a carbon atom next to a carbon atom. Give them a, enough time and enough, a nice tight environment, they'll assemble themselves into a diamond, the hardest, hardest naturally occurring substance. Because the carbon and the carbon are joining themselves together with what we call a covalent bond. I actually came across a couple days ago this, uh, an online science communicator, and she was using the analogy between, uh, the next slide is ionic bonds, so spoiler alert. 
um, the, the analogy that covalent bonds are like two people getting together and sharing a milkshake, like two straws, one milkshake. That, that, that's how close they are, right? I mean, they're out on a date. This is a great date. They're, they're sharing the milkshake with, with the two straws. A less great date would be you go out and one person eats an apple down to almost the end and then hands it to you and says, here, you can finish this. That's an ionic bond. Not, this, 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 it's a weaker sort of bond. It's not, I, I love that analogy. It, it, the, it's still going to hold things together. You know, they, they both like apples, but they don't like them together as much as they like, or they don't want to hang out together as much as two people who would share a milkshake. So, so this is kind of the example. We'll come back to sodium chloride, like I said a number of times here. But sodium chloride is, is an ionic bond. The, the sodium has a certain amount of requirements that it would like to fill to be stable. The, the chlorine has something to offer. And they'll come together and ionically sort of share, uh, give a, an electron to one to the other. And they'll make salt, sodium chloride. And they'll make this pattern, again, it's back to the pattern building of one has six around it. This one has six around it. It makes this pattern for quintillions, septillions of atoms in all directions to make something like a, a salt crystal. And again, in terms of talking about habits, the salt crystals have this wonderful cubic habit, cubic cleavage. It's easy to, to take a razor blade. If you ever take like a big, big chunk of salt, like you find like road salt, and you can take a razor blade, and you can chop that into a nice, neat little cube because the, the, it just breaks nice and clean right along each one of those, those atomic planes. A diamond, you can get it to cleave as well, but it takes a lot of very precise effort so that you only hit it exactly where you want it to before you can get those atoms to separate. So covalent, very strongly attracted to each other and bonded together. Ionic, less of a strong bond, more easy to separate. So the, we have these two, two things, but we're going to talk also about something called a mixed bond, mixed ionic covalent bond. Because everything, remember, nothing is, is exactly one end or the other. There's always kind of some in-betweenishness about things. And something like silicon dioxide with the silicon with the oxygens around it extending as a pattern, that's a mixed bond. Fairly covalent, because silicon and oxygen are pretty similar. But it's still got some ionicness to it, ionicness to it. Calcium carbonate, clay minerals, you're getting increasing amounts of ionic and this mixed ionic covalent aspect to it. So kind of keep that in mind now. We've, we've begun to be, uh, think about how atoms are put together to begin to make stuff. But now let's talk about once I've got the stuff, how does that stuff itself mix together? And we're going to just kind of keeping working our way outwards here until we get to a mass of something. So, and also in terms of defining words, I, we're going to start using the word mixture in a very specific way. We don't just mix things together and say that everything's mixed, because it's not to a chemist in the language that we're going to use. So a couple of examples of mixtures are salt and pepper. I can take salt, and I can take pepper, and I can pour them together on a table and smoosh them together. I haven't made something totally new here. I haven't made a new stuff called salt pepper or anything. I've just made a mess. And I can go in with a, with a hand lens and a, and a paintbrush and a lot of patience, and I could mechanically, physically separate those back out into two separate piles. That's a mixture. I can put it together. I can take it back apart again. Oil and water is another example of a mixture. The two things, they, they don't, we say we don't, they don't mix. Well, they're at a fine enough scale, they are mixed together. But they're maintaining their own identity, even though they're broken up into these little bits. And again, I could go together and I could pull the, pull them, the two of them apart. But there's something else now called a compound, where if I put the two things together, something else happens. The classic example of this is back to our friend sodium chloride. Now, if I have chlorine here, so this is, oops, spoiler alert. Uh, so chlorine, chlorine is a gas. It's a green gas. It's a toxic gas. It reacts in, in air. It reacts with the water in the air to make hydrochloric acid gas. It's very, very toxic, very dangerous. We use it as a chemical war agent at the time. Sodium is this weird, soft, gray metal. You've probably never seen, or very few of you have ever seen, just sodium out in, in, in the world. Because if I was holding a piece of sodium here doing pass rounds, it would be like exploding in my hand. And as much as I like explosions, that's not what I want them to be doing. But if I take the chlorine and the sodium and I mix them together, 
I make something that makes, makes, you, makes life possible, that makes your food taste better. So toxic gas, explosive metal, salt. What's happened? Clearly, I didn't just mix them together. What I did is I chemically reacted them. I made a compound. I made this totally new thing called sodium chloride, which is like is tight, tightly bound enough together that the atoms lose their original identity. They become a new thing. They become that couple, right? That, that it's like we shipped them for that, that, they've, that we've got this whole new thing. Another example of things that can react together to make a new compound, silicon and oxygen. So silicon, this is, it's another sort of gray thing like most of the things on the periodic table are. Um, but this is a very, very light material. It actually, I, if I had a piece of silicon and passed, if I was gonna offer it to you and looked at, oh, it's gray, it's gonna be heavy, it's a metal. It almost feels like plastic when you grab onto it. It's a very strange, brittle, metallic looking thing that's not really, not really a metal. Oxygen, well, it's a gas again. All this is liquid oxygen. I'd like to put this up because most people have never seen liquid oxygen. Liquid oxygen, when it's cooled down sufficiently, um, what's the um, uh, boiling point of, of oxygen? Do you know? <laughs> I'm a biochemist, nice. Uh, it's very cold, a uh, few hundred Kelvin. It's actually this lovely shade of, of purple, or almost lavender type of, type of shade. That's liquid oxygen, so if I take this weird, plastic feeling gray stuff with this stuff that makes a blue liquid, I can make quartz. Clearly, again, they're not a mixture. They've actually joined together intimately to make something totally new. So I've got mixtures, I've got compounds. A third class of combined stuff that we're building toward now is this idea of a solution. Now what you need to know about solutions is solutions are what happens when you dissolve a solute in a solvent. Everybody get that? No. So words again, right? So a solution has a solvent, which is the thing into which you are going to put the solute, which is the thing that's going to dissolve in the solvent, right? Something goes into something else and something special happens. Again, just like how with a compound, the silicon and the oxygen or the sodium and the chlorine become something totally new. A solution is something that's totally new. Even though it's made of known things, something special happens when a solution is able to form. And what that is, is the, what was, say, our sodium and chlorine, and we put them into our hydrogen hydroxide here, our water, the sodium and the chlorine can come back apart again. But they don't come apart and become the toxic gas and the explosive metal this time. Now they become something that we call an ion. And an ion is a version of an element or a combination of elements that is, that it's not the pure, it's not, the, not that raw element form. It's stabilized. It's able to continue to have this desire, this naked charge out there that wants something. But the, something special about the solvent allows that, that naked desire to be uh, suppressed. So, Again, to, to, the, to the human analogy, sodium chloride being that couple that are bonded together, the, the solvent is sort of like this place where they can go and they can, sort of, they can actually unhinge for a little, un, unhitch for a little bit. It's that bar or whatever and they can hang out together and just visit their own friends and just sort of move around. And then, but once the solvent's gone, once they leave the bar, they're back together again. So solvents are new things because we've taken things that have their own properties and given them a special environment. A great example of this, you all will understand, is putting salt on ice. Right? We do that around here. We haven't had, aren't doing it today, which is nice. Uh, but what happens when we put salt on top of ice? Somebody? Anybody? The ice melts because we heated it up, right? That's how you make things melt. No, we didn't change the temperature of the ice at all. We just added something to the water as the water, it, it, the little film of liquid water takes a little bit of the sodium in, sodium chloride in, breaks it up into sodium ions and chlorine ions, which makes something that melts at an even lower temperature. And then it be just begins to bore through and dissolve more of the sodium and the chlorine inside of the, inside of the water, and slowly the ice will dissolve down to about a, a, a minus 17 Celsius, you can get the water to freeze at a lower temperature. 
That's kind of weird. You're changing the temperature that the water freezes. No, you're not. All, what you've done is you've created something totally new that we call a solution that actually just ha on its own has a different temperature. You see the difference? We've made something new that has its own type of behavior, just like the sodium and the chlorine coming together to make the, the, the salt. The salt and the water come together to make something new that we call a solution. Similarly, to round up applying this to our, to our glass question, sodium dioxide, silica, quartz, sand, however, whatever words you're using to describe it, can be a solvent. To make glass, I'm going to dissolve soda ash or sodium carbonate pentahydrate or hexahydrate and calcium carbonate. I'm going to dissolve those things into the silicon dioxide solvent to make something new, which is a liquid, if I give it enough heat, that will melt at a different temperature than the silica would on its own. So silicon dioxide on its own, if I have a quartz here and I was lucky enough to have a hydrogen torch in my hand, I could melt that. It would, it, in Fahrenheit degrees, at about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit, I could get that to melt. That is not an easy temperature to get to. Celsius, it's uh, around 2,000, 2,100 degrees Celsius. But if I dissolve some sodium ions and calcium ions into that silicon dioxide, I make this new thing that will melt at a mere 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which still sounds pretty high, but that's totally approachable. And honestly, it's been approachable by humans for about 7,000 years. So 2,000 Fahrenheit, easy peasy. We can take this unmeltable stuff and turn it into something new that we can then turn into new things. So what is glass? Well, glass is an, a mixed ionic covalent solution. Everybody happy with that? It's, a, it's, it's, it's accurate. It's relatively precise. Is it useful? Not really. Because it still doesn't tell us, but, but, but is it a solid? Well, that's where we get to the question that our friend here is trying to answer. What is a solid? So to, to get at that, we need, again, to sort of step into, into some new terms. And let's, let's talk about what scientists have traditionally meant about the idea of solids, liquids, and gases. And we're going to do it with, uh, with kids on a playground. So cast your mind back to childhood, and not on a Saturday, but on a Monday through Friday. It's uh, around noontime. You've been locked up in the classroom all morning. Maybe you had a, a morning recess. We did. Not everybody gets that snow day. It's been a bad day. Just you had your lunch, teacher opens the door, and you're just so full of energy that you just explode out onto the playground, right? You're running around crazy. You've got so much energy. You're bouncing off the fences. You're bouncing off your friends. You don't, you're just, for the moment, you're just happy to be out and about and just moving. These are children in their gaseous state, OK? We have vaporized the children. We've given them so much energy that they've lost any sort of cohesion to their environment, to each other, to their friends, to the playground, to what their plans were. They are just, they're, they're just vaporized, OK? Give it a little bit of time, maybe a few minutes, enough, enough bouncing around. You know, good thing the fences are there. If the fences were down, the kids would just expand out into the town, and we'd never get them back. But the fences are up, so they lose some energy bouncing off, the fen friends, off, off their friends and the fences until they, they begin to, OK, it's, it's lunchtime. I, my plan, I was going to play kickball. I was going to skip rope. I was going to play in the sandbox. I was going to do something. And I was going to do it with, with my friends. And you begin to recognize your environment a little bit. And so you begin to sort of come together and you begin to have some association. You're still full of energy, but, there, there's, a, there, but, but you're, there's a confinement to it, that you have a cohesion of some sort. These are liquid children. Okay, we've taken out enough energy that they've condensed from their vapor phase and become liquid. Now, they're, they're filling up the, the shape of the playground still very nicely, but they're not, if, if you, now if you took the fences out, there's enough kind of going in that they have a certain amount of, of uh, surface tension, if you will, that, that can kind of hold them together and they're not going to just run. You can, you can catch them now because they, they have a, actually have a viscosity that you can measure. 
So see, 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 what, see how I'm doing, right? You have this mental image of things and you have these, these social constructs that relate to them that actually can give meaning to this atomic scale phenomenon that's really quite complicated. But now we have liquid children, cool. Let's see our liquid children, yeah, this is a build. So there's my liquid children, All right? See, they're, they're starting to come together a little bit. Finally though, it's, it's the end of lunch recess. They're cooling down enough. The teacher knows it's time to get them inside. And so the teacher, the, the, the bell rings, the first bell, and it's time to line up, okay? So the kids focus where they're supposed to be. They get in lines. If you're as old as me, it's you know, boys line, girls line, shortest to tallest or whatever, or by alphabetical order. I know I'm supposed to be here. I'm in Mrs. Jones' class, and someone's in front of me, someone's behind me. And finally, you're all in lines. The teacher marches you back inside, and, and everything's great. We have solidified the children. But more than solidifying them, this is, we're, we're, we'll make the assumption, and, and I'll, I'll just use the term good kids, all right? These are kids who, in the time that they were given, knew where they were supposed to go, got in line, and, and, and are ready to go inside. This, these are crystalline children. Technical terms we'll use for them, they're ordered, all right? They're crystallized. They're following their patterns. That, that's a specific type of solid. But let's, let's think about a more, a, a, a maybe more realistic situation, is uh, maybe we've got some bad kids, which we'll just interpret as a little more, maybe more artistic, maybe more free thinking. They, they, as, as, the, uh, as, as that energy began to, to dissipate as, re, as, uh, as uh, recess was going on, they began to, maybe they left the kickball game to go hang out with their friends. Maybe somebody's got some music and they're dancing and they're holding hands and they're, they're making rings and chains and just sort of moving around together. Totally separate from what they were supposed to be doing when they were so all liquefied. They've actually begun to de develop some levels of order. They were more prone to ordering at a higher temperature than maybe some of their friends were. Now, when the time comes for everybody to get in line, they've sort of begun to do something a little different. And it's going to take a little bit, it's going to take some time for them to disconnect from where, they're, where they were because maybe they have friends in other classes or they're, they're sort of following some different rules. Now it's time for them to get in line and they just can't get there. It's, ah, hmm. Uh, they're, they're kind of laying on, the, they're, they're already, they're, they're, they've already solidified before they got the line. At this point, the teacher will say, just, everybody just sit down where you are. We'll figure this out. The energy is gone. They're not moving anymore. This is glass. Glass is made of a mixture of good kids and bad kids who, because of that conf confounding nature, were unable to get in crystalline order when the time was, when the bell rang. Does everybody know what glass is now? Glass is disordered. Glass is, another word that scientists will use, glass is frustrated. Glass is a frustrated material. Partially, because, I think it's because it's frustrating the teachers. But it's also be, the, I mean, the, the good kids at heart, right? They really want to do what they're supposed to do, but they simply weren't able to get where they needed to go. So they end up being this frustrated, disordered material. Some examples of, uh, in real life of this happening, I mean, give a little more clarity on, on, on what we're talking about here. So this is a, a, a kind of rock. We recognize, we shout out. Granite, yes. So granite, as a rock, is a mixture of different compounds. Each of those compounds in, in geospeak, we call them minerals. It's a mixture of, so there's some quartz in here, and there's some biotite here, and there's some, this pink stuff is plagioclase of some sort, and there's probably also some garnet in here. So three or four things that at one point were all a liquid. They were all lava or magma. But then the energy went away. They started to solidify. But they weren't able to, well, in this case, a lot of the, the teacher gave them a lot of time. Make sure I'm getting this right. Teacher gave them a lot of time. And they were able to find the, their friends that they wanted to hang get with all their classes, the biotite class and the quartz class and the plagioclase class. And they crystallized as their individual units and were able to go inside. So the mixture was able to come down and become this, a, a liquid mixture was able to become a solid mixture. This 
is, who, who knows? Obsidian. Obsidian is a volcanic glass, a naturally occurring glass. It is essentially the same atomic composition as the granite. Obsidian is granite that didn't get long enough to cool down. It was exploded out of the volcano. It was a fast flowing flow that found the ocean or was on the outside of a major flow so that part was able to cool more quickly. Obsidian and granite, atomically the same. Kinetically, we say, or in terms of how much time that was given to solidify, very different. So it became two different things. This one is a mixture of different crystal structures, different ordered domains, different uh, grains of, of mineral. This, just this continuous mess of frustrated children who weren't able to get in line. Glass, like this. I, I should have, I, after yesterday, I should have an example of a Libby glassware or something, right, to, to honor for, uh, my, my, some of my hosts. Glass also wants to be three things. And when we're talking about glass, we're talking about soda lime glass here, the most common type of glass that we have, like 90 to 5 percent of the glass in the world is soda lime glass. Soda lime glass wants to be three things based on the formula, based on this mixture of, of quartz and sodium carbonate and calcium carbonate that were originally put into the mix. It wants to be something called wollastonite, which is a calcium silicon oxygen compound. It wants to be something called devitrite, which is a sodium calcium oxygen uh, compound. And of course, it wants to be quartz, because there's lots and lots of silicon dioxide. But what glass makers have learned over the last 3,500 years is if you put these things, put those raw materials together, these things don't get a chance to happen if you cool it down fast enough. Instead, you get glass. Glass is something that didn't happen. Glass is non-equilibrium. It didn't get a chance to go all the way, order up, crystallize, and become the three things that it really wants to do. Because in the process of cooling it down, some of these things melt at different temperatures, even though they're all mixed together like the oil and the water, but they're all dissolved in each other now because they're a solution. In trying to come out of that solution and organize themselves with their friends, the silicon oxygen starts to make these long chains and things, and the sodium comes in and starts to make its own chains. And things get so tangled up, so in between, that by the time you get down to the point where the, that you've taken out so much energy that it can't move anymore, it can't move anymore. It can't rearrange itself. It can't find its way into that pattern. So glass is what happens when a pattern doesn't get a chance to form before the liquid gets too stiff for things to rearrange further. Is that a solid? Is that a liquid? Well, it's what it is. It's the stiffness, the ability for it to, to break or to be formed. I mean, you're forming it as a liquid, right? It's fluidity as in its molten state and also the wonderful forms and shapes that you get out of that when you're working the glass by machine or by hand, makes you think, well, it, it's, it's liquid because it, it was doing this liquid thing and then it just it stopped doing it, but did it really stop being liquid? But then you drop it and it breaks. Well, if it's breaking, then it must be a solid. But didn't I hear somewhere that cathedral windows keep flowing? Didn't a scientist tell me that or a science teacher or something tell me that? So you, you get this, you getting, the material is giving you mixed messages because you're trying to listen to it with a language that it's not, that you don't uh, understand. You're, you're looking for solid liquid. Is it solid or is it liquid? Well, yeah, because those aren't the right words. Because it's not a thing. It's not something that has arrived at a destination and said, I am who I am. I am equilibrium. I am stable. I am all together as one. It's like something that was trying to go somewhere and got stopped. And it's frustrated about it. It's 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 in between. It's it, it didn't it didn't get to it didn't get to a word that you can uh, that you can use. It's a verb. It's something that if I continue to, if I give it more energy, it would continue to, it would continue its journey. Glass artists deal with this all the time. It's something called divit, where if I've got glass in this nice fluidy sort of state and I heat it up again to enough so that the kids can begin to move around a little bit, they're good kids. Like I said, good kids at heart. 
they're going to find their way into their, into their lines eventually. And I can make a piece of glass, clear, as beautiful as this. If I hold it at around, for example, around 650, 700 degrees Celsius for a couple of weeks, it'll turn into a rock. It'll turn into this weird white crystal rock that actually it'll turn into a, a pile of rocks as it rips itself apart as the different crystals begin to grow. And these solid-like behaviors and liquid-like behaviors, this is glass's superpower. This ability to be a solution as a, as a liquid state and then to be formable as you're starting to cool it down and then to be shapeable in certain ways when it, when it uh, finally gets to, to rigidity, I won't say solidity, but at least rigid enough to break. Artists and scientists and nature use this in different ways to make amazing things happen with the material. And because of the solution behavior, just like if, I have a, if this was a salt and water solution, I could throw in some other things. I could dissolve other things into it. I could, you know, I could turn in, add some ethanol, for example, and turn it into something very different. Um, add some sugar, add, add, dissolve other things into it. I could turn this into a cake if I added enough stuff to it. With glass, I can add other atoms to it to turn it into colored glass. Or in, in the case of this is borosilicate glass, which has its own set of properties different than sodaline glass. It melts at a higher temperature, but it also has a lower thermal expansion. It, it's, it's less prone to thermal shock. Not because of any sort of magic that I did. I just changed the formula. It's a different group of kids confounded in a different way that when I heat them up and cool them down again, they're going to behave in a different sort of way. Different solutions, different behaviors. Glassiness gives us that flexibility to make different types of behaviors by what we dissolve into that solution. But ultimately, we want it to follow, we, we want to end up with something that has that, that workability, that, that, that time, that in-between time where you can, where it's got some gooiness to it, some shapeability to it, so I can plastically change it into different forms before it finally becomes hard and rigid. So I can make the, the, the dear to me after working at the Cordy Museum of Glass, this 200 inch uh, mirror for the Palomar telescope, for example, made out of glass very similar to this actually, borosilicate glass in the 1930s, pouring this 20 tons of Pyrex into a single mold and having it hold together so that it could then be polished into a nearly perfect mirror surface that then wouldn't change shape very much as the, through day and night as it heated up. It made the perfect telescope mirror. Or this is uh, Dante Marioni. He's a glass blower out of Seattle, one of the world's greatest glass blowers. Makes incredible, beautiful shit. You can see some of the examples of his work along here. These beautiful fluid shapes by hand. Him and a team of a few people have mastered this fluid period to be able to adapt his own body and, and his own changes to the way that the glass is changing and moving so you can uh, make incredible patterns. And this, anybody know what this is? It's called a fulgurite. Yeah, it's a, it's a lightning strike glass. So when lightning hits the ground in some, in some cases, it can be sand, it can be soil. Um, sand is the most famous. The heat of the lightning melts the sand and the calcium carbonate and whatever else is in there high enough that it can melt. So this is where you get to that 3,000, 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit that you can't get in most other ways. It melts it and fuses it and makes a glassy thing that is an image of the shape of the lightning strike as it hit and, and moved through the ground. You can find little ones, you can find gigantic ones like this. But it, it, this is that special stuff that glass can do because it can sort of go out and then get trapped in, in a certain configuration and stop and take, its own, take, it, take a shape that represents things that nothing else can do. So, Chemistry cat here. <laughs> Let's kind of sum things up. Glass is a verb. Is glass a liquid or a solid? Not really. <laughs> it's something that's happening. It's something that's in between. We say it's a non-equilibrium material. It's frustrated and disordered, and it's constantly involving in relationships to, in, to its environment. How many people in the room does that describe? <laughs> You're a verb. Right? You're not a solid or a liquid. You're not a thing. You are something that's always happening, always responding, just like glass. And it's this in-betweenity that gives it its unique behaviors. We don't want the glass to crystallize. 
We want it to stay like this, all uniform. Makes it easier to see through. It makes it easier to grind and polish. It's showing us where it came from in its fluidity and in, in, in the smooth shapes that it can form. So it gives, it has some opportunities, but it, it, my, my gratitude in terms of uh, sort of uh, job security, it has some challenges as well. It's, it's, constantly, uh, it's constantly challenging scientists and engineers who can see the potential of what it could be because of its clarity or because of its hardness or because of the way that it changes shape when it heats, when it's heated and cooled and other properties. There's lots of interesting opportunities there, but there's also a lot of interesting challenges. And by understanding how things are put together and not getting boxed into certain definitions, but really staying as fluid as the glass or as, as defined as the glass, we can find ways to make new things with it. So it, you have to embrace its verbishness, verbis, verbness, verbosity, whatever the word is going to be, in order to come to where an understanding of what glass can actually be. So with that, I will open things up for questions about what you think glass is or quite a confusion that people might have. But thank you for your kind attention. Knowledge Stream is made possible by a generous gift provided by the Appold Family Charitable Fund.